apa-apa. Let's go. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath, everybody. You know, we're not going to give the, any more, the enemy any praise today. And if you've been on 57, there's unscheduled traffic. They cut four lanes down to one, but that's okay. We're here. So the word that comes to my mind is hallelujah. I made it to church, but hallelujah, worthy to be praised. How about that? Okay. participation. We praise you, O Lord. We magnify your name. Now, there's a part we're going to ask you to sing with us. I'm going to demonstrate. We're going to demonstrate. And then we want you to sing with us. Can you do that? Okay, yes.
last song. <laughs> That's my wife right there. Emmanuel. How many know what that name means? Emmanuel, we worship you. Church St. Louis, come. Come, let us adore him. Come, let us adore him. And a special welcome to all of our guests that are gathered in this space. It was in 1944, on September 26th, that a group of African-American believers in the wake of what was happening in black America and 
in the wake of the Jim Crow laws that affected us all over this country, they gathered together and said, we have to find a more effective way to reach urban communities. It was a public affairs issue that needed to be addressed if they were going to experience growth. And they gathered together at the Shiloh Seventh-day Adventist Church in the south side of Chicago. And I am so grateful that we have gathered again today for this public affairs and religious liberty rally. We are living in the very final moments of Earth's history. Do you know how I know Jesus will come soon? I know he will come soon because most of us believe we have more time. And that is the most significant indication that we are close to the coming of the, the, the Messiah. What I'd like to do is I want to extend our gratitude from the Shiloh Church family to Orlin Johnson, the North American Division Public Affairs and Religious Liberty Director. Let's put our hands together if you're comfortable with that, welcoming and thanking him. Thank you so much. We want to thank the Lake Union and the Lake Region Conference, and we have guests here from Indiana Conference, from the Mid-America Union. We have guests here from, I think we have a friend going to Washington soon. You're going to leave us behind in Berry Springs. And I am so grateful, a mentor and a brilliant light from afar, uh, Pastor Dwight Nelson and his wife. So glad that you've come with us, uh, come to uh, worship with us and lead us in this significant discussion. What I want you to do to feel welcome is I'd like you to just look around, look around to the people around you. And I want you to just say, Jesus is coming soon. Jesus is coming soon. Now you can say you have heralded the gospel tonight, and I want to thank you for being here. We're going to bring up our Lake Region Conference Public Affairs and Religious Liberty Leader Director. He's doing a brilliant job, Mr. Edward Woods III. Why don't you put your hands together as we welcome him? Title, let the church say amen. Oh, we can do better than that. Let the church say amen. We are excited that the Lake Union Conference is partnering with us for this public affairs and religious liberty rally, but we're also disappointed that we will no longer have our leader and Dr. Nicholas Miller. And we would be remiss for those of you that were wondering how we had the EEOC letters, the Sabbath accommodation letters, how we've had this synergy, um, I would like to say from my brother, from another mother, but Nick Miller has never been afraid to speak truth to power. Let me say it again. He has never been afraid to speak truth to power. He has been called all kinds of names besides being a child of God for speaking up for justice whether it was the George Floyd incident, whether it was Breonna Taylor, whatever it took place, we could always count on having someone who could identify with Christianity instead of identifying with skin color. And we would be remiss in Lake Region Conference if we didn't recognize the phenomenal leadership that he has provided in this office. As you all know, I've been volunteering for 14 years. This is my 15th year. And we have a true friend in Dr. Nicholas Miller. Before I get into anything else, I would be remiss, Nick, come on up. But we want to present on behalf of the Lake Region Conference. This is an exemplary service presented to Nicholas P. Miller, PHCJD, Parole Director, Lake Union Conference 2016-2022 for advocating and championing the cause of public affairs and religious liberty. Come on and let's give our brother in Christ, Dr. Nicholas Miller, his due. Let me do what they quote unquote pay me to do. On behalf of the president, Dr. Garth Gabriel, our secretary, Dr. Abraham Henry, and our treasurer, our treasurer, um, Yolanda Stonewall, we bring you greetings to the Great Lake Region Conference. And thank you for being here as well with this partnership with Lake Union. We want to thank Dr. Miller, but we also want to thank your pastor. Let me say it again. We want to thank your pastor, John Boston, because in this 
transition, he's made this seamless. We started off with your head elder, Travis Price, in terms of going through the board and securing the facility. And then after Dr. Boston came on board, he made sure things went well. So I want to make sure we know that we appreciate Shiloh. We appreciate Pastor Boston. want to recognize David Graham and the Shiloh Praise Team. Can we say amen? for what they have done. And then after we are done here tonight, we also have, we also have a reception in part. It's good to partner with Lake Union. Not only do you get the music, but you get fed. So after we're over tonight, we want you to come over to the fellowship hall, to the parish hall, and let's fellowship with one another. Let's get to know some of I don't know, I don't know everybody in here. Do you know everybody in here? Well, hopefully by the time we get over to the parish, we can meet and engage and um, fellowship with one another because we have to remember, and this is just something that's so important, that although we are a mixed multitude, we are one blood and one faith in Christ. Let me say it again. Although we're a mixed multitude, we are one blood and one faith in Christ. And that we are responsible for our actions and our reactions and how we represent Christ in spirit and in truth. And so as you come here today and engage and ask, ask your questions, let's not forget who we are and whose we are. I would be remiss if I didn't recognize the outstanding pastors that are here from Lake Region Conference, Dr. Richard Sylvester, pastor of the Milwaukee Sharon and Hosanna Churches, and the area leader for Chicagoland, Pastor Sylvester, will you stand? And we want to recognize from the Stratford Memorial Seventh-day Adventist Church, if you haven't heard this young brother preach, he is a firebrand in in his own right. Stand up and also welcome our stewardship director for Lake Region Conference, Pastor Nikolai Grees. Thank you so much. And then we see that we do have a pastor from the Illinois Conference, formerly with Lake Region, um, Pastor Ralph Shelton. Why don't you go ahead and stand? We see you and want to recognize you as well. And want to make sure we haven't forgotten any pastors. And last but not least, um, being a volunteer in ministry, I know how important it is to make sure we recognize spouses' wives. Can we do that? Can we recognize? I want to recognize Pastor Carla Boston, Sister Carla Boston, Pastor Carol Nelson, Sister Carol Nelson. Is there anybody else's pastors' wives that is here? We want to make sure we don't forget anybody because this is important. And I want to recognize my new friend. Can we recognize my new friend from Lincoln, Nebraska? Carol Huguenot, stand up and wave. wave, 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 Carol. There you go. All right, I think I've covered the waterfront. Thank you so much. God bless you, and please continue to support our public affairs, religious liberty ministry in Lake Region and abroad. And last but not least, I want to welcome and thank our AV team here at Shiloh for the outstanding job they're doing. Brother Cecil Curran and his team I want to make sure we thank them. Thank you so much. God bless you. And let's welcome the dynamic public affairs on religious liberty director all the way from the nation's capital from capitol hill seventh day adventist church none other than the speaker who spoke here today the brother the doctor orland johnson oh there we go i want to thank woody for that introduction he made me feel like i should be in the corner with my gloves on getting ready to come out or something but uh, we had a good time here today. And I want to thank the church for being so warm and, and, and just inviting. We had a great dinner afterwards. And I just want to bring you greetings on behalf of the North American Division of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, where our leadership there under G. Alexander Bryan and our treasurer, Mr. Randy Robinson, and also Kiyoshin Han, who is our secretary. And we are really, really excited to be partnering with the Lake Region, with the Lake Union, and, and really working in conjunction with, with Dr. Dwight Nelson as well and being part of this fellowship. You know, I, I tried to tell everyone today that, you know, when we think about public affairs and religious liberty, there's this idea that there's kind of like this battle of, of strong-arming political leaders and making judges do what we want them to do and, and somehow holding back the winds of strife and ensuring that prophecy will not be fulfilled. It could not be further from the truth. Our job is very simple. It's to make friends before we need friends and to remind our brothers and sisters that no matter what happens, you're already free in Jesus because somewhere I read and believe that he who the sun sets free, he who the sun sets free is free indeed.
So we are just glad that you're here with us today. We look forward to continuing this program. Uh, Dr. Nelson's going to come here with some powerful words that I'm sure will be inspiring. I was really taken into the warmth of the number of questions and comments that we had regarding this. And one thing I'll say that really, really struck my heart was the number of young people who had comments and questions. You know, we had something during the day where some the pastor asked the individuals between the ages of 18 and 45 to stand up. It was almost half the church. The idea that you are still bringing in individuals who are young enough to understand what we can do. I had a young brother come to me at lunchtime today, and he said, I'm so glad you said something about young people. I said, listen, man, I got a 28-year-old, a 25-year-old, and a 23-year-old, and if I finished the sermon without talking about them, I would have got my phone ringing even before I got to the car. So I know how this takes place, and I am just thankful for the work that you're doing. So this time, I'd like to bring up an individual who's going to introduce our speaker for today, and it's Dr. Nicholas Miller, who's our parole director for the Lake Union, also the general counsel for the Lake Union, and just an individual who has been involved and on the front lines for a very long time. So thank you for your warmth. Thank you for your hospitality. Greetings on behalf of the North American Division, and please join me in welcoming Dr. Nicholas Miller to the roster. Thank you, Dr. Johnson. Um, it's a great um, pleasure and privilege and honor to be able to uh, both welcome and introduce a man who has been a, a mentor, a colleague, and a friend probably for more years than he remembers. Um, and the moment is made all the more solemn today than I had anticipated. Uh, some of you may have heard that at his sermon this morning, uh, Dr. Dwight Nelson announced that, uh, not his retirement, let's be clear on that, but announced that he will be discontinuing from his role at the Pioneer Memorial Church on June 1 of 2023, so about nine months from now. So this could be the last time that he's in Shiloh uh, as the pastor of the PMC Church. He'll obviously have uh, many more sermons at PMC in the coming year. Uh, so it's a bittersweet moment for us all, um, and certainly for me, uh, though it does put a kind of nice bookend on, uh, on my career here in Berrien Springs. I've been at Andrews for nearly 18 years now, far short of the 40 years that, that you will achieve. Um, and I've been at the Lake Union for about eight years, and this is my last formal event as parole director for the Lake Union. I'm moving to the Washington, D.C. area. I will continue teaching for the seminary, uh, but do so from a place where I can run the International Religious Liberty Institute uh, at a, a location that makes a little more sense than Berrien Springs. And I'll continue uh, uh, teaching there. but. Um, I first met Dr. Nelson uh, when he was the young pastor of Pioneer Memorial Church. There was a lot of buzz in the air. This young guy, was he 30 yet? Just around 30, uh, and the pastor of one of our flagship institutions. And I was a freshman student at Newbold College in England, and he came over uh, to deliver a week of prayer. And it really was a very powerful, moving, and inspiring event that certainly had an impact on my young life. And he came and visited all the students, at least the ones who, uh, who wanted, which was most of us, in their dorm rooms. And we spent a few minutes talking, and he had a prayer with me in that dorm room about my future and about my calling from God. And uh, I would have to say that was part of the pathway that led me to where I am today. And so here we are at, at my last event for, uh, for the Lake Union Parle. Uh, he's just announced his retirement, and I have uh, much to be thankful for in his ministry and years uh, as the rest of the Andrews University community does. Uh, but let's focus on what we have, not what we're losing. And uh, Pastor Dwight has been a powerful influence on our Andrews campus, both in the church that he pastors as well as in the university community that he mentors. Um, he doesn't, uh, is, is more than a pastor of a church, not that that's, uh, that that's certainly a full-time and all-embracing feature, but being on the campus, he sits on the, the president's cabinet. I had the privilege to sit on him with that for a year when I was the chair of the faculty senate, and on a weekly basis, 
He, for all many years, has engaged with the leadership of the university, and he has also taught courses for us at the seminary in the, uh, in the D-Min, in the, in the uh, ministry department. And many, many young Adventist pastors have been mentored by him, both in the church as well as in the classroom. Uh, he will be a man who really won't be replaced. Somebody else will move into his position, but there will be no second Dwight Nelson at Andrews University. Uh, I'm very grateful for his willingness to come out and uh, spend his afternoon with us here in Shiloh. Uh, we have an audience not only in this building, but this program has been promoted uh, not only by the Lake Region and Lake Union PR departments, but also Liberty Magazine and the North American Division uh, Parle Department have been promoting it uh, widely uh, across the division. So we are also wanting to welcome those of you who are tuning in online. And I believe the next voice you'll hear after mine will be my friend Dwight Nelson. Thank you, Nick. And I'll comment about you in just a second, but happy Sabbath afternoon, Shiloh. Man, it is, it is such an honor for Karen and me to be in this space. You know, I've been over, as Nick has mentioned, at uh, the Pioneer Church at Andrews for a few years. But I have been hearing about Shiloh from the get-go. You used to have a pastor here. I don't know if you remember him. Was it Mac Wilson? Yep. Mac and I were on the uh, Lake Union Conference Committee together. He was just a sharp dude. He was just a great preacher, a pastor. but. Sure enough, I saw on the wall his picture. You've had, you've had some august spiritual leaders. But I'm really delighted for my young friend, John Boston II, and his kindness in stepping out of the pulpit and letting somebody outside come in like this. Pastor John, congratulations on your new appointing. I listen to WBBM. Can I just tell you that? W have you heard of WBBM News Radio? I listen to WBBM every, every morning of the week except Sabbath. So Lori Lightfoot is my mayor. And I, I am tracking the story of Chicago every single morning. And to think that God put Shiloh in the heart of the Windy City for such a time as this, for such a time as this, Mrs. Pastor, God brought you both here. And I met Travis, your, your elder. You got great leadership here. The best is yet to come. And John, that's the truth. I believe for all of us, the best, Pastor John, is yet to come. With Jesus, not because of you, not because of me, but with Jesus, the best is yet to come. So thank you, uh, Woody Woods, for your kindness. And I, 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 I've known Woody forever. And the other two or three years ago, he said, Dwight, give me, your, give me your, your cell phone number. Well, I'm really hesitant to give my cell phone number out. He said, come on, just, you got a cell phone number? Give it to me. I said, okay, Woody, I'll give it to you. And uh, starting the next Sabbath morning and every Sabbath since, I get a text from Woody. Now, it's not just me, but Woody, where are you? There you are. He, he's texting the whole Parle team and every member in the Lake Region Conference. Do you get his text too? Yep, okay. D will those just continue forever till Jesus comes? <laughs> so anyway, Woody, thank you for, for your leadership with Parle in this great Lake Region Conference. And Nick, you're the, you're the one that invited me to come. And I'm honored that uh, you extended that invitation. I have known Nick for a bunch of years, but you know what? I've forgotten completely about that New Bowl College. That was 1985, the fall of 1985. Karen and I were there together, and it had just a wonderful week of prayer. And there were a lot of American kids. Uh, Alvin Glassford, you remember, was there as well. And he just is retiring from Andrews Academy. And uh, so Nick, Praise God. God. God obviously has had his eye on you from the get-go, and I'm grateful that that prayer and all the prayers that have ascended from your mom and dad and beyond uh, has, have brought you to your station now. So 
Nick, Nick and I have been kindred spirits. He, he kind of hinted at that, but uh, we share a lot of the same values. So, Nick, I don't want to just kind of keep going here, but uh, thank you for your friendship. And God bless you. And as you, as you head over to the, the uh, East Coast, it, it's quite a, a law firm that he has joined. I mean, I went online. I needed, to, I needed some help, and I called Nick up. And uh, I needed somebody that had some power behind his credentials, and that law firm <laughs> has what, what uh, I needed. And so thank you, Nick, and everyone. Without further ado, I'm going to have a prayer. Would that be all right? Yeah, let's, 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 let's talk to Jesus. Oh, Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name. The praise team just swept us heavenward. Our hearts have been watered. We have a few more minutes in the Sabbath that you've entrusted to us. The sun is shining through this beautiful stained glass window. We're grateful to be alive. We're grateful that the almighty God of the universe is our personal creator and our forever friend. And as we spend these few moments, and we're going to ask ourselves the question, could Jesus really be coming soon? Open our minds. Don't let us just treat this <clears throat> as just somebody else's, uh, just, a, just a, another passing fancy. No, God, speak clearly to our minds. And then give us the courage to be what you're calling us to be in the light of the times in which you've called us to live. In Jesus' name we pray. Let all the people say amen and amen. All right, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put on the screen now uh, Chris Martinson. He's a, he's a research uh, uh, a scientist. He is a futurist. And he has a, he has a website called chrismartinson.com. I got this from him. And ever since he gave this example, it has changed the way I think about the soon coming of Jesus. And that's what we're going to talk about for the few minutes we have together. And I'm going to put a baseball field on the screen right now, and you're going to tell me whose ball field is this. And I'm assuming that this thing will, will get me up there to the... To the uh, I'm using the one you gave me. Is it... There we go. Anybody recognize that uh, ball field? Now, you have to be really an aficionado of Major League Baseball, but that's Fenway Park. Now, everybody knows who plays in Fenway Park because in our, in our guaranteed rate field, who's playing? Sox. Chai Sox, of course. And I'm American Leaguer, too, as you are. And so the, everybody knows the Chicago White Sox. But on the screen is, the, is, is Fenway Park, Boston Red Sox. Okay. So Chris Martinson, he said, hey, listen, let's imagine that I take you and I'm going to march you up to the highest, the highest bleacher, up in the nosebleed section, all right? Right field, left field, doesn't matter. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to handcuff you to the highest, highest chair. You're handcuffed. And then I'm going to leave you there. I'm going to walk down to the pitcher mount, pitcher's mound. You see the pitcher's mound in the center of the picture? Picture, in the center of the picture. And I'm going to, I have in my hand a magic eyedropper. And I'm going to use that magic eyedropper at the stroke of 12 noon. And we're going to assume, for the sake of illustration, Fenway Park is, is watertight. Water can get to the top and then stop. So when the clock strikes, strikes 12, I drop one drop on the pitcher's mound. Now, the reason it's a magic eyedropper is because in one minute, that, bro, that drop becomes two drops. And in two minutes, the two drops become four drops, and then, then eight, then 16, then 32, and 64, and 128, and 256, and this is as far as I can count. Okay, so you get the principle. Every minute, it's going to double. Now, you got to get out of that stadium, Fenway Park, before the water goes over your head, obviously, or you'll drown. So, how much time do you have to break free from your handcuff and get out of that? Get out, of that, uh, get out of that bleacher. The truth is, for minutes, you will see no appreciable increase of water. Nothing, 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 nothing. In fact, at 1244 in the afternoon, there will only be five feet of water on the floor of Fenway Park. 93% of the stadium is empty. How much time do you have now? 1244. The truth of the matter is, you will have five minutes. In five minutes, the water will be over your head because we forget 
as human beings about geometric progression or the power of compounding. They just keep doubling and doubling and doubling. Now, that is what Martin is saying, is the point he's making. I want you to think about this. The planet today is set up in a perfect storm with what, what Martinson calls, Chris Martinson calls, the hockey stick graphs. Everybody knows a hockey stick goes down the whole time, down, down, and then all of a sudden what? Up, right? He says we've got hockey stick graphs going all over the place. He says we're talking about the population of the earth, just plain, simple, 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 nothing, nobody. We're talking about oil depletion on the planet, no problem, no problem, for centuries, for centuries. But all of a sudden, these graphs are all like a hockey stick shooting up. And he says the challenge is we have these graphs shooting up in the same moment. Bless you. Thank you for that. What's going on? As a researcher is warning us, tonight on this planet, we have hemorrhaging debt, true or false? I mean, our debt is in the trillions and trillions and trillions. Isn't that right? Yeah. We have hemorrhaging debt. We have oil and energy depletion. We have scarcity of water. That's the big resource that we're running out of on the planet. We have scarcity of food combined with burgeoning number of mouths to feed. We, th we thought we had time. <laughs> that's, that's, the world's not in a big problem. We got time. Ah, Martinson's point. Let me put it on the screen for you. Here's what he's saying. I'm reading. I think I'll read it right here. And that right there illustrates one of the key features of compound growth. The one thing I want you to take away from all of this, with exponential functions, the action really only heats up in the last few moments. Here's the deal, ladies and gentlemen. The last five minutes are what's critical. We're looking down here, hey, we got time. Chicago's not that bad. We got time. Bering Springs is not that bad. We think we have time. Hockey stick graphs, shh, they all are peaking at the same time. My, oh my, oh my, in the last few moments, didn't Jesus make that point? Come on, let's put Jesus on the screen. There it is, Matthew chapter 24, 37 to 39. Let me see if I can read it from here. As it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. You remember these words, don't you? For in the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage up to the day Noah entered the ark. That was a massive antediluvian a hockey, hockey stick graph, nothing's changed, nothing's changed. Isn't that what Peter says in 2 Peter chapter 3? People come along, scoffers say, nothing's changed. Nothing's changed on this planet. Don't believe Jesus is coming soon. Don't believe the world is ending. Everything has gone on as it has since our fathers long ago. That's the fatal delusion. Jesus says, come on, look at Noah. And they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them all away. This is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. My, oh, my, the last five minutes are critical. And we think we got, we got all day. Oh, isn't that what Paul is telling us? Look at this, First, Thess First Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. Now, brothers and sisters, about times and dates. Come on, do you believe Jesus is coming soon? Listen, let me remind you, he writes, we do not need to write to you, for you know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a, like a what? like a thief in the night. While people are saying peace and safety, destruction will come on them suddenly as labor pains on a pregnant woman, and they will not, and by the way, that's a double negative in the Greek, they will no, not ever escape. Just when you're thinking you can retire and sit back on easy street, boom, it's over. That's what Jesus is warning us about. That's what Paul's trying to tell us. That's what Chris Martinson, who's not coming from a Christian angle at all, he says, just watch these hockey sticks. Shoo. And by the way, Ellen White makes the same point. May I put her on the screen? Great changes are soon to take place in our world, and the final movements will be what? Rapid ones. And then I go to that apocalyptic classic, sitting on the front pew. Great controversy. What is she right there? The end will come more quickly than people expect. 
So whenever I hear somebody saying, hey guys, you know, we've seen this stuff before. Don't get all agitated about this. I'm thinking to myself, yeah, right. The last five minutes are what's critical and we're not watching those five. <clears throat> well, no one knows the date of Jesus' return. I understand that. Be forewarned that the exponential function means that suddenly all the indicators will simultaneously spike with blinding speed and all it will take and I'm going to come back to this point again and again before I sit down and this panel takes over. All it will take is a, is a major crisis of crippling proportions. The one wild card in the human race's hand that we have no control over. One crippling crisis. It can be, it can be economic. National financial collapse, igniting urban violence, social meltdown. It could be ecological, a killer quake in California. If 10,000 people were killed tonight in California, God forbid, the nation would be on its knees tomorrow morning. Why? Because it's outside of human, it's outside of human intervention, that's why. I got a chapter in this book, those of you that signed up early, God bless you. There's a chapter in the book on comets, asteroids. Scientists are now saying that is not some little sci-fi notion. It can happen to the, to the human race. Most of the comets, most of the asteroids are not tracked. They're not even known. They're too small, but they're of killer uh, dimensions. Listen, it could be a natural, a, a natural crisis. It could be political. What did, what did January 6th remind us? It could be a terrorist dirty bomb that destroys a city. People are now talking about civil war. That's all you need. You just keep, that, keep the press covering that story. We're going to have civil war. We will have civil war. It'll be a self-fulfilling prophecy. It could be military. One button pushed in this Ukraine-Russia business, and it's World War III. Come on, we're, this isn't rocket science. You already know all of this. One more. How about uh, a super pandemic on steroids that makes our recent COVID-19 crisis look like a kindergarten dress rehearsal? One major crisis. That's the deal. I'll come back to that again. One major crisis. And now factor in this. Social scientists have discovered, and you'll read this in the book, social scientists have discovered that cataclysmic events create, quote, conditions peculiarly fitted to the rapid alteration of belief systems. You could have believed all your life this way, but when there is a, when there is a collapse, suddenly what you believe can, can be changed overnight. Oh, man, just that one line has apocalyptic written all over it. Minds will change just like that. So it's not surprising after September 11, come on, everybody knows this, that when given a choice between uh, less, less liberty for more security, the pandemic has done that to us too, less liberty but more security. Americans vote more security. Let the liberties go. Give us, give us security. Give us assurance that this will not happen to me, that I'll be safe. I believe the crisis will be the hotbed that gives the woeful birth to the apocalyptic endgame of Revelation outlined in this book. One crippling crisis. Martinson's point, the last five minutes are critical. So here's the question. Are we there yet? The recent congressional January 6 hearings have meticulously in the glare of live television cameras. Have you seen any of that? have examined the fateful day when our Capitol building and ostensibly our American democracy were under mob attack January 6, 2021. Only via these hearings we are learning now how close we came to constitutional crisis and national meltdown. In fact, we learned this. The Secret Service agents with Vice President Pence were calling home in that lockdown Capitol building telling their families goodbye because they are certain they're going to be killed by this mob that has broken through. They believe this is it. It was an attempted insurrection, a coup. John Meacham in, this, in his book, The Soul of America, The Battle for Our Better Angels, shares, a, I gotta share this with you, a provocative observation from another American writer named James Bryce, titled the book, The American Commonwealth. Let me put this on the screen for you. James Bryce warned of the dangers of, re of a renegade president. Now, Rice is not talking about anybody that you're thinking about right now, okay? Okay? He's not talking about that. This book came out before, Bryce's book. Bryce's view was not that the individual himself from the White House could overthrow the Constitution. No, no. 
Oh, disaster would come, Bryce believed, at the hands of a demagogic president with an enthusiastic public base. A bold president, quoting Bryce now, who knew himself to be supported by a majority in the country might be tempted to override the law and deprive the minority, and Adventists are very sensitive to that word minority, deprive the minority of the protection which the law affords it, Bryce wrote. He might be a tyrant. Now, this is very interesting. He might be a tyrant, not against the masses, but with the masses. You get his point? The majority is going to get its way. And anybody say, excuse me, excuse me, a uh, hand on the back row, I'm just a little minority here, but uh, you don't mean us getting rid of us, do you? Yes, we do. That's what he's talking about. My, oh, my, oh, my. Are we there yet? Flying in that capital, storming Ma, by the way, on January 6th, perhaps you saw it, a yellow banner proclaiming the news, Jesus saves. <laughs> Did you see that banner? There were Christians in that, in that mob. You know that, don't you? Jesus saves. The enigma of this hour of American history is that religion itself, Christianity in its Protestant, Catholic, and Orthodox manifestations is itself just as divided and fractured as the wider nation. And guess what? So is the Seventh-day Adventist church. Don't you be trying to pull the wool over my eyes. No way. That wool is 97% rayon anyway. No. We are as divided as they are outside those doors. Come on. The pandemic itself exposed the ideological divisions within our church when suddenly Adventists were aligning themselves as either pro-mask, pro-vaccine, or anti-mask, anti-vaccine adherents. And of course, we're all free. We are free as Americans, free as Adventists to believe whatever you want. But we must be careful how we align ourselves divided as we all are in this nation, evangelically, politically, morally, and publicly. I'm going to share something fascinating with you. A friend of mine gave me a book this summer, and I've been reading it, written by Mark Knoll, a, a brilliant evangelical. In fact, he's the one that wrote The Scandal of the Evangelical Mind. He's, just a, he's an intellectual in the evangelical community, has, has lectured over here in Wheaton College in, in, in Chicago. Okay, so this is Mark Knoll. His book that just came out, 2022, Ameri and the title of the book is America's Book, The Rise and Decline of a Bible Civilization, 1794 to 1911. Okay, Mark Knoll observes. I, this, this is, hold on, look at this. The combination of education and the Bible in early American history would soon emerge as a key feature of the American attempt to create a Protestant civilization. Hmm. He says, you have no idea the place of the Bible in the beginning of United States history. Keep reading. Most comprehensively, against Thomas Paine's claim, deism offered a fully satisfactory replacement for Christianity. Thomas Paine was an atheist who said, listen, agnostic. He says, listen, you don't need Christianity. We just, we'll just have deism. Against that claim arose an almost universal, in America, these fledgling United States, universal affirmation of traditional confidence in Scripture. Keep reading. In a word, responses to the age of reason, that's Thomas Paine's book, demonstrated even as it strengthened an overwhelming American commitment to the Bible as God's revealed word. In the beginning, America was big on the Bible. Now, that was new to me because I've been schooled in a uh, strictly separationist home, fifth-generation Adventist, fourth-generation Adventist preacher. Man, no, no. And, and I've heard people say, well, you know, uh, re those people, the, the evangelicals today are just revisionists. That's what they're doing. They're trying to rewrite history 300 years ago. They're dead wrong. Turns out Mark Knowles says, no, they're not dead wrong. They're dead right. The Bible was the basis of language and culture. Uh, let, me, let me read another one. Here's another one. The public appetite for Bibles, and the little B Bibles is his, stoked by the preaching of Methodists and other active evangelists, fueled by the energy of printers and publishers, had already become one of the most salient cultural facts in the new United States. We were a Bible-believing nation in the beginning. I'm not making this stuff up. He's not an Adventist. Mark No, brilliant mind, taught at Notre Dame University. In fact, Nick Miller was one of his uh, uh, graduate assistants and did research for him. And he mentions Nick in, the, in, in his book. 
Now, where are you going with this, Dwight? Well, let me just read, uh, read one more here. Within three years, from 1812 to 1815, the Bible Society of Philadelphia had run off 14,125 complete Bibles and 3,250 New Testaments from a single set of plates. Now, interestingly, in the period from 1794 to 1815, American printers came out with a total of 186 different novels. But they produced an extraordinary 246 editions of the New Testament or the entire Bible. The B-I-B-L-E. Yes, that's the... Has your praise team sung that recently? Probably not. Yes, that's the book for me. That is the story of America. I never knew that. What's the point, Dwight? Ah. Quoting Noah one more time, production of the Bible by American printers alone made it the world's best-selling book. Now, before I bring Ellen White in, because she's going to have something to say about this, he talks, he quotes a, the, the, the governor of Massachusetts, Caleb Strong, who became governor in 1800 and who made an impassioned case, come on, this is religious liberty we're talking about, an impassioned case for public worship and moral instruction in the public schools of his state. So here come the words of Caleb Strong, the governor of Massachusetts, 18, 1800 and on. As religion, Caleb Strong, Governor Strong said, as religion is the only sure foundation of human virtue, the prosperity of the state must be essentially promoted by a due observance of the Sabbath. <laughs> Someday we're going to hear that very logic. We're going to hear that very logic in, a, in the U.S. of A. This is from Massachusetts Governor, 1800. Keep reading. And by meeting together of the citizens as we gather, to learn the duties of moral obligation and contemplate the wisdom and goodness with which the Almighty governs the world. My, oh, my. Now I want you to juxtapose these words with a paragraph from Ellen White that I, I don't know why I've never caught this before. It's in Great Controversy. And it just blew me out of the water. And, and, and it's going gonna, it's gonna to get your attention. So without further ado, let me put Ellen White from that apocalyptic classic, Great Controversy. Let's put her on the screen. As the tidings, she's talking about the four, you know, pilgrim fathers and all of that, the early history of America. As the tidings spread through the countries of Europe of a land where every man might enjoy the fruit of his own labor and obey the convictions of his own conscience, thousands flocked to the shores of the new world, to, to America. Colonies rapidly multiplied. The Bible was hailed, she writes, as the foundation of faith, the source of wisdom, and the charter of liberty. Is this a kind of a religious liberty gathering? The Bible was the charter in the beginning of liberty. Keep reading. Its principles were diligently taught in the home, in the school, and in the church, and its fruits that were manifest in thrift, intelligence, purity, and temperance. Keep reading. It was demonstrated. Now, this is profound. It was demonstrated in our early history of America, that the principles of the Bible are the surest safeguards of national greatness. I'm not making that up. That's been for, for, for over a century in great controversy. Now, why am I bringing that to our attention? I'll, I'll tell you. One more line, the feeble and isolated colonies grew to a confederation of powerful states and the world marked with wonder the peace and prosperity of a church without a pope and a state without a king, end quote. What's the point, Dwight? Here it is. Third millennial Adventists, I'm talking about you and me, must be wise to discern common points of solidarity with our evangelical, and you're not going to like this, but I'm going to say it, and yes, religious right neighbors who unabashedly publicly advocate a return of America to the Bible and God campaign for the sake of national revival. We've worked hard to align ourselves on the opposite side of the ideological spectrum. We have. Why? Because the, uh, the, the liberal left is big on the separation of church and state and big on minorities. And we need both to survive. But I heard my friend, Pastor Johnson, just a moment ago talking about, I scribbled it down, Orland. We need to make friends before we need friends. That's brilliant. That's the very point I'm trying to make. We got to quit sticking our fingers in the eyes of evangelicals. We got to quit sticking our fingers in the religious right. Ah, oh, white supremacists. Psh, have no time for them. Listen, if everything looks like it says it looks like in the book of Revelation, we need all the friends we're going to, we need all the friends we can have. Liberal left, radical right, it doesn't matter. We need friends. 
Our job is not to make enemies. Our job is to make friends. Critical need that we have friends who will speak up one day when we can't speak up for ourselves. So avoid this, avoid this unnecessary antagonizing of those who find great solace in the formative influence of the Bible on American history. There, there is no need for us to go against this suggestion that the Bible was, as Ellen White has told us, the Bible was indeed once very formative in both culture and governance, as Mark Knoll has shown us. Seventh-day Adventists ought to be champions of biblical morality and the universal Bible principles embedded in the Ten Commandments. And I love the point that that stained glass window is making. Look at that stained glass window. It says that's what we ought to be championing. Not just the Fourth Commandment, all ten of the commandments. All ten. In this day of wanton violence, gun violence, you know about that in Chicago, social violence, economic violence, racial violence, Seventh-day Adventists ought to be foremost in speaking up in defense of Jesus and his moral law that protects life, not slaughters it. The recent Supreme Court decision regarding Roe v. Wade, I'm not wading into that. Without us debating the abortion issue, that the court is now remanded back to the states to decide. The very nature of this stun... Now, here's the deal. Here's where I'm going. The very nature of this stunning turnaround or reversal by the high court has revealed... Listen to this. How quickly... Remember the last five minutes are critical? How quickly a majority of the justices can redirect constitutional opinion and reverse established constitutional precedent. They just say, hey, we change our minds. We change our minds. It's gone. Send it back to the states. The right no longer exists. What was once an established right overnight, it's gone. What do we do now? Who do you appeal that to? You've gone to the highest court of the land. Where are you going with this, Dwight? I'm telling you. What was thought to be guaranteed protection can quickly be dispensed of with seemingly little recourse left. I'm not talking about abortion now, but I'm wondering about the First Amendment. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibit prohibiting the free exercise thereof. This right to worship God according to the dictates of our own consciences. I get to worship Him on any day I want, and so can you. Could even that right one day somehow be reversed? After all, come on, help me out here. Everyone has noted how political the judicial process now appears to have become. Come on, you think about this. The highly politicized nomination and election process for justices, please. The leaking of the majority opinion to the press. Somebody had some agenda and it went. The suggestion now that justices are indeed influenced by public opinion. And in a time of national crisis, there's that word I'm coming back to. In a time of national crisis that suddenly changes public or even government opinion, will that influence the court to hastily review other rights once considered inviolable? I'm just saying, sit up, sit up. Let him who has ears, let her who has ears hear. Let him who has eyes see. Once, once this, this, this sacred pantheon of, of the Supreme Court, suddenly now, we're not sure anymore. Turns out the court is more human and subject to human vacillation than we may have first thought. One crisis. One crisis. Where are you going with this, Dwight? Listen. If, if Revelation 13 describes the emergence of the United States as a geopolitical and eventually religious power that becomes a global enforcer, and I believe it does, and a little book that you were given if you registered uh, here, uh, you read the support for that. The Earth Beast is going to become this global enforcer. And if the mark of the sea beast, the first beast in Revelation 13, the other geopolitical religious power outlined, recognized by many as the wounded, dark, and Middle Ages church that effectively ruled Western civilization for a millennium, if the mark of the beast is the antithesis to the seal of God as embedded in the seventh-day Sabbath, as you have it high overhead, as I believe Revelation confirms, then listen, listen, then America today as fractured as we are socially, economically, racially, politically, morally, ideologically, spiritually, America is rapidly becoming a crisis waiting to happen, a slow motion train wreck that we are all watching and saying, who's stopping this? Who's going to stop it now? If the pandemic taught us anything, 
It showed us how major sea changes globally and nationally can transpire literally overnight. How quickly Congress can be motivated. Political opponents now are, are agreed. Opposite parties are now in union. A crisis suddenly rewrites the playbook. Just as it did, by the way, in the crucifixion of Jesus. That was a collusion like no other collusion before. What happened? You have Herod and Pilate who are arch enemies who are united. You have, the, you have the Pharisees and the Sadducees, arch enemies who are united. You have Jews and Gentiles who've been enemies who are now united. United for what? The extermination of one man that stands in the way of their global dominance. One man is in the way. Get rid of him. We are gone home free. That's what happened in the crucifixion of our Lord. Will it happen again? Of course it will. I recognize that it was once fashionable to label the great controversy, I'm talking about the book now, and its apocalyptic predictions as simply a product or a child of the times. Oh, she was just a child of her times. As if she could be the child of anybody else's times but your own. Oh, she's just a child of the times. The book's a child of the times. You know, anti-Catholic as America was in the late 1800s. Sunday law agitation going on, so she picks up on that. And how, but how unlikely such a time-worn scenario is for our sophisticated and complicated third millennial lives and world today. But I beg to significantly differ with that old trope. I'm I'm tired of hearing it. We're seeing that it holds no water at all. That book was spot on. And we are now watching, we are now watching the coalition, the, 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 the collusion of heretofore disparate factors. I'm going to give you three and then sit down. Three examples of why I believe that old trope is gone. She's not a child of her time. She was a messenger of God. Just read my book. I don't, use my, I don't use her to prove my book. The book stands on its own. Okay, three, three examples why I believe that. Number one, what has the war in Ukraine revealed to observers? Again, I need you to think now. What's the war of Ukraine, the war in Ukraine revealed to everybody who's looking on? Here's what it's revealed. How rapidly isolated Russia's leader and his global aspirations have become as never before. And suddenly, get this, the United States, kind of limping through uh, the world community, is, is pushed to the front of the crowd, and a heretofore weakened NATO is now led by America with spreading authority and influence over Europe. And Europe is the seat of the Holy Roman Empire where she will be resurrected back to life one day for a brief span. And now America standing with stature before the world again. Interesting. Okay, that's one. Here's, here's the second one. What does the Pope's recent penitential pilgrimage to Canada reveal to observers? His halfway mea culpa is a reminder of an institution desperate to regain the higher ground of public opinion, particularly with the moral and political debacle of Rome's plague of pedophile priests that has shamed the institution before the world. All Rome needs now is one massive crisis. And the whole world will say, we need a moral leader. And there's not one in the U.S. And there's not one in England. And there's not one in China. They'll find one leader who will stand up and say, children, we must band together. Come on. Hey, one more. What does global, the, the, this is fascinating. What does the global electronic surveillance modus operandi reveal to observers? What well, we now know that if you've got your device on you, somebody in the world knows where you are. Not that they're watching you, but they know where you are. If you have your device on you right now, Jean Iris, do you have your device on you? Yeah, they know where you are. In fact, the GPS tells them that you're on the front row of the Shiloh Church. Let the world be known. Yeah, you move over closer to Debbie, that's wise. Every device we have. Rod Dreher, in a book that a viewer uh, sent to me, Live Not By Lies, a manual for Christian dissidents. This is fascinating. Des designates one section, China, the mark of the East, which is a clever twist of the phrase, mark of the beast. Let me put, let me put Dreher on the screen for you. He's talking about China. There's oh, the, the, the story, the, the word is in now on what's going on in China. You know what? They are watching us. <laughs> this thing isn't working all of a sudden. There we go. Uh, I wanted to, uh, this is, before I get to Dreher, L.O.I. wrote this. 
Isn't this something? The Lord has done more for the United States than for any other country upon which the, the sun shines. Don't you go around telling people, we don't have a blessed beginning. Yeah, that Bible's not that big a deal in, in, in American history. Nah, it's nothing. Nah, you're so wrong. It's the, it was the credentials of national greatness. And God was shining down on this little earth beast in the wilderness. It rose up out of nowhere, shining down. Why? Because he needs a free base for his global movement. And he says, I got it right now. How long will he have it? I have no idea. Now we go to Dreher. Beijing's use, this is interesting, Beijing's use of consumer data, biometric information, GPS tracking uh, coordinates, facial recognition, DNA, come on guys, you know all about this, and other forms of data harvesting has turned and continues to turn China into a beast never before seen worldwide, not even under Mao or Stalin. Keep reading. In China, the tools of surveillance capitalism, because they're capitalistic like we are, are employed by the surveillance state to administer the so-called social credit system, which determines who is allowed to buy, who's allowed to sell, who's allowed to travel based on their social behavior. Now, if this is beginning to sound familiar, that's intentional. I touched something here. Turns out a great majority of Chinese pay for consumer goods and services using smartphone apps or their faces via, via facial recognition technology. The social credits, if you take your dog out and the dog poops on the street, they have cameras on every street corner. So if your dog poops on the street and good neighbors never let their dogs poop on the street and they got a picture of your dog pooping on the street, minus points, you get discredits. You begin to accumulate these. They keep, they keep a little account for you. You help an elderly person across the street, good for you. Plus points for you. So the citizenry is going to want to keep building up the points. True or false? Of course. I want the recognition. A surveillance state is going on halfway around the world. Ah, but it's not in America. Come on. Are you serious? You ever heard of PayPal? How many here? No. You know PayPal. Everybody knows PayPal. Do you know that PayPal has forbidden white supremacists to use its services? Well, you say, good for them. We don't want white supremacists getting any kind of break in our society. Well, I understand that feeling. But do you, do you understand that one day it won't be white supremacists? It'll be you. It'll be me. No, I'm sorry, you can't. Uh, excuse me, what was your name again? No, you don't, you, you don't have an account with us. <laughs> oh, it says deleted. Uh, sorry. Now, keep reading, keep reading Dreher. The bottom line, a Chinese citizen cannot participate in the economy or society unless he has the mark of approval from Xi Jinping, Xiao Ping, the country's all-powerful leader. Keep reading. In a cashless society, the state has the power to bankrupt dissidents instantly by cutting off access to the Internet. Now keep reading. And in a society in which everyone is connected digitally, the state can make anyone an instant pariah when the alg algorithm turns them radioactive even to their own family. Hey, I know who you are and I know who your mother is. Guess what? Ch -ch -ch -ch. Mother now cannot have access. What happened there? Hey, I know who you are, but I know who your daddy is. Ch -ch -ch -ch. Now daddy can't. Suddenly you have become radioactive. Why? Because you're a problem. And we're going we're gonna to make, we're gonna make your friends and family begin to put social pressure on you, saying, hey, get off of this. Whatever you're doing, stop it. It's affecting me. It's brilliant, but it's coercive. You say, it's not going to ever happen in America. Oh, really? Have you heard of Executive Order 14... 067, I left my papers there on the, on the front pew. President Biden signed that executive order. You leave it there. Signed that executive order in March this year. I've looked at that order. He's setting the ground for what they call e-cash. In fact, a few days later, in the House of, in, in the House of Representatives, H.R. Bill 7231 was brought to the floor by f five congressmen no coincidence, just a few days after the executive order, also pushing for cash, e-cash tracking. Not to track you, ostensibly, but to just make sure that we don't have the criminal element taking over. And hey, listen, you read the, read the, read the uh, 
the, the and by the way, the, the bill has not been passed in either the House or the Senate. But isn't it something? E cash. So that you'll have something that will be it will behave like a dollar. It will, won't have your name attached to it, theoretically, but it will be available to you. And when you give it to me, that electronic gift, I take it and it's like you gave me five bucks. And I'm saying, hey, thanks. You want change? What's going on? Well, before I sit down. Revelation 13. You got your Bible with you? I'm not putting this on the screen. Revelation 13. Pick it up in verse 11. Speaking of the second beast, the earth beast, that will rise up to support the first beast, the sea beast. Verse 11, and then I saw a second beast coming up out of the earth, and it had two horns like a lamb. This is gentle. It's young. It's, it's, oh, the Lamb of God is a big hero in Revelation, so there must be some kind of Christ connection in the beginnings of this church and as we, of this country. And as we found out, there are huge divine blessings in the beginning of this nation. It had two horns like a lamb, and it spoke like a dragon. It exercised all the authority of the first beast on its behalf. And it made the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast whose fatal wound had been healed. And it performed great signs, even causing fire to come down from heaven to the earth in full view of the people. Because of the signs it was given power to perform on behalf of the first beast, it deceives the inhabitants of the earth, the entire planet, by this global policeman power, this geo-religio political power, the whole earth will obey. And it ordered them to set up an image in honor of the first beast who was wounded by the sword and yet lived. And the second beast was given power to give breath to the image of the first beast so that the image could speak and cause all who refused to worship the image to be killed. It also forces all people, great and small, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hands or on their foreheads so that they could not buy or sell unless they had the mark, which is the name of the beast or the number of its name. We now know, th thanks to China, that the hit of one... One keyboard strike can separate you from everything that speaks of economic sustenance. One keyboard strike, and you can't buy, you can't sell, you can't do nothing. We used to kind of chuckle at that and say, oh, man, you know, the, 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 uh, the, the scanners in the grocery store, those are the new mark of the beast. You don't have to worry about the mark of the beast. The mark of the beast is not something physical and, and, and uh, quantifiable. It's, a, it's, a, it's an ideology. It's a worldview. But they'll have the power behind the keyboard strike, stroke. To turn it on or to turn it off, depending on your choice. The decision, sir, is yours. It's not mine. It's your decision. What will you decide? Sign your name right here. Come on. Is Jesus coming soon? I believe with all my heart he is. Do I have a date for it? No, I don't. If Jesus were to come tonight, would you be ready? I'm talking to you. If Jesus would come tonight, would you be ready to face your Savior. I'm just asking you a simple question. What is your mind telling you right now? Are you ready? What's your conscience saying? Are you ready? Maybe there's something, well, I mean, I, he's not going to come tonight, so I'm not worried about that. Why would you be worried? If there's something making you worried, then shouldn't you be dealing with that something right now? This fall at Andrews University and Andrews Academy and Ruth Murdoch Elementary School, we're talking about sexual purity or sexual addiction. We're going full court with pornography, the number one killer of the human race right now. I spent the summer studying it, not looking at it, studying it. The number one killer, <laughs> the number one killer of boys and girls and men and women. I have a young couple, married couple, because of pornography coming into my office. I have a much older and mature married couple coming to me. The wife is coming for anointing this. It's so serious because of pornography. 
Are you ready for Jesus to come tonight? If he came tonight, there'd be some man, I, I wish I had known. <laughs> come on, they said you have to see Sunday laws. And who says you have to see Sunday laws? A car accident means you'll never see Sunday laws. If you're killed going home from Shiloh tonight, you'll never see a Sunday law in your life. The second coming happened to you in this split second, and you have to choose now, my friend. You have to choose now. What is Jesus in my life? What is Jesus for me now? Jesus, Son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus, Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world, have mercy on me. Is he the same Jesus who was here 2,000 years ago? Of course he is. Is he, is he the Jesus that can save me tonight before I drive home? Of course he is. All you need is your mind, one stroke of a key in your mind that says, I want you more than anything. I let this go. Hey, what's the Bible promise? But there is no temptation that has overtaken you except such as is common to man. But God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted above what you are able, but will with the temptation provide what? Wave escape. Jesus, if you're coming tonight and I'm not getting home tonight, I'm making a decision right now. I choose you as the Savior of my life. I put my life in your nail-scarred hands. It's as simple as that, folks. You don't have to come forward. You don't have to stand up. You don't have to do nothing but one stroke of the key in your mind that says, I choose Jesus. And he has everything. He has everything to make tomorrow the best day of your life. You don't have to live with what you're living with now. Get that thing out of your life. I don't know. It not, may not be pornography, but get it out of your life. Why hold on to that? Like the people before the flood, eating and drinking and feasting and laughing and until the day the flood struck and it was too late. Jesus says, come. Come to me and I'll give you rest. The Spirit says, come. The book ends that way. The Spirit says, come. The bride says, come. Let she who hears say, come. Let he, him who hears say, come. Come to him. Come to me, Jesus says. Why not? Could Jesus come tonight? Good. For you. Not for me. For you. I want to pray with you. Oh, God. We've gone from apocalypse to gospel. There's no sense in talking about prophecy and having panel discussions about religious liberty if our hearts aren't right with you. And I don't know a single heart here, Father. I only know my own desperate need as a human being, as a man needs the mercy and the grace of Christ, my Lord. Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace. Son, he said, your faith has healed you. you, you I believe you. you, you that, that, that keystroke, I receive it. Go in peace. I'll be there tomorrow morning. I need you. We got our friendship to grow. Don't worry about when I'm coming. Just stay with me. And you'll be fine. Oh, God, for every man, woman, and child here, point out the keystroke. Let them strike that key. In the name of the Lord Jesus. And now be set free. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Holy Spirit. We love you back. Amen.
and for me. Come home, come home, ye who are weary, come home. Softly and tenderly, my Jesus is calling. He's calling for you and for me. and tenderly Jesus is calling calling oh sinner come home oh come home Well, thank you for that, Brother David Graham, that just tied in with Pastor Nelson's closing so perfectly. It was a real blessing to all of us. And uh, Pastor Dwight, that's exactly what we needed to hear, your presentation. We discussed with the Parl leaders this week the future direction of the Parl ministry in the church, and we all agreed that we needed to have a closer relationship between the legal, advocacy, social issues we were dealing with and the Adventist prophetic message and outlook. Our pioneers had that, the two horned beasts, the, the, their understanding of prophecy drove their involvement in anti-slavery, in prohibition, in opposing Sunday laws. These weren't separate items. It was part of the prophetic gospel. And your presentation tonight brings us back to that prophetic gospel. Uh, and we're, we're going to transition 
to, and we're, it's going to be relatively short, we're going to have a panel with uh, various PARL leaders from around the country to give a short um, discussion of an issue, a legal issue, a court case, a social issue, um, critical race theory, kind of in the light of what Pastor Dwight has painted for us, right? How can we understand this topic, this court case, legally and as citizens, but more importantly, how do we understand it in light of the prophetic message and gospel that we've got? Um, to lead into that, this program is also sponsored by Liberty Magazine, and we have a, a quite a new editor of Liberty Magazine, um, Bettina Kraus. Uh, could not be with us today. She had assignments back in the Washington area. She was with us earlier in the week. And I'm hoping, uh, at least we made arrangements for her to address the group live over a uh, stream yard. And yes, I do believe that I see her there now. And uh, she holds the distinction of being the first uh, woman editor of Liberty Magazine. Uh, after 120 years of male editors. She has broken the glass ceiling and, uh, and, we, and we have a, a, a female voice at the top of our religious liberty ministry. And I think we will be better off for it, both because it's a woman's voice and because it's Bettina Krause's voice. Bettina is from Australia. And uh, her husband, Gary Krauss, works at the General Conference in Global Missions. And I've asked her just to talk with us for uh, two or three or four minutes about Liberty Magazine and her vision for it in the coming years. Bettina? Nick, thank you so very much for that introduction. Um, and what a powerful message we've heard this afternoon. I'm just so thrilled that we at Liberty Magazine can be a sponsor of this event because we've been reminded that we have been called to speak with a prophetic voice, not just about the future, but also about the cultural um, and the political realities of today. And most importantly, when we do speak, to speak in ways that reflect the character of the God that we serve. Now, Liberty Magazine is focused on doing exactly that, in making friends before we need them. It's been published by our church for more than a century, and it reaches into the offices of judges, of lawmakers, of city officials, of, of county administrators, school boards, people of influence in your community who, who are in a position to influence public policy in both large and small ways. And it brings to them a unique Adventist perspective. It's, it's a biblical perspective, it's a prophetic perspective, and it speaks directly to the current issues that we've been hearing about this afternoon. Now, if you're curious about the Ministry of Liberty Magazine, I'd invite you to, to check out our website. Go to liberty, libertymagazine.org, look through our archives, subscribe to the magazine, take the magazine to leaders in your community and share with them that unique Adventist perspective. Now, the very first issue of Liberty Magazine rolled off the presses in 1906. And at the time, there was a whole lot going on in American society. There was this groundswell of, of public support to take state level Sunday laws and make a national Sunday law and also to alter the constitution in ways that would make it difficult for religious minorities. And so, on the first page of that first issue of Liberty Magazine in April 1906, the editor outlined the philosophy that was going to guide the voice that we would use when we spoke to these high level officials. And he wrote, he wrote this, he said, we will champion liberty for the weak and for the defenseless because we believe that no power but the power of love can rightfully compel the human conscious, no power but the power of love. You know, as has been made very clear by Dr. Nelson, we are living today in extraordinary times. There is a whole lot going on. And in the next panel discussion, we will also have that um, affirmed. 
But the message of our church and the message of Liberty Magazine remains exactly the same as it did almost 120 years ago, because we serve a God who cares about the rights of the weak, of the defenseless, and he does want to transform society, but not through compulsion, not through laws, not through force, but through love and through the faithful, loving witness of his followers. So I pray that each one of us, as we uh, continue with this program and as we look to the week ahead and months ahead, may we find ways to reflect the character and the love of God as we speak to society's realities today. Okay, so thank you for that, uh, Bettina. And at this point, I'll call our Liberty uh, Parle directors to come forward. Um, they know who they are, and I will uh, introduce them as they come forward. We have uh, John Ashmead, uh, who's an attorney, and he's the Senior Assistant Counsel at Yale New Haven Health, and, and he's uh, the Assistant Public Affairs and Religious Liberty Director for the Atlantic Union uh, Conference. And that's John uh, Attorney Ashmead right here. He's being followed by Attorney Daryl Hunegard, who is the uh, Legal Counsel and Parl Director for the Mid-America Union. <laughs> Behind him is Vilo Weiss, uh, he is from here within the Lake Union. Uh, he is the Parl Director for the Indiana Conference of Seventh-day Adventists and is an attorney as well. Immediately uh, here behind me to my right is Andy Im, and he is the Public Affairs and Religious Liberty Director for the Michigan Conference as well as the Communications Director. And he's... He's joined in that work by his wife, Laura M., who is sitting over here. Uh, she has two children to uh, look after. She's the assistant um, parl director as well as the human resources person at the Michigan Conference. Orlin Johnson from the NAD has been introduced, uh, as has our good Sir Edward Wood uh, III. So what I'm going to do is I think I'm going to start over here. Each uh, of our respondents has, has chosen a subject matter topic or area uh, to spend a, two or three minutes responding on. And I'm going to go ahead and start with John, and we'll just go down the line here. And uh, probably if you grab the mic and uh, tell us what the topic is and give us your thoughts. Sure. Uh, good evening, everyone. It's my pleasure uh, to be with you here. And the topic that I'm supposed to talk about is civil rights and critical race theory. <laughs> A very challenging issue today. But as I look at this issue, um, there is a, a uh, a, a passage in Hebrews chapter 6 that Adventists are very afraid of touching, but I think it, it really helps us understand the issue of civil rights. And I think it's the 23rd verse where it says that Jesus went behind the veil as our forerunner. And, and when I read that passage, you know, and I think about Jesus, he was one of us and he has now entered into the sanctuary in heaven at the seat of power to advocate on our behalf. And, and to me, this is what this whole issue of civil rights is all about. Um, at the founding of this country and the ratification of the Constitution, there were certain voices that were excluded. Uh, African Americans, women, and poor whites. Uh, you, the, the, the right to vote by these groups was not what it should be. And we have spent the last over 200 years uh, through amendments, uh, through court decisions, um, through legislative actions, through protests, trying to expand the franchise to everyone. That is the core, the key issue. That 
you know, for a more perfect union, every voice should be represented. Every interest should be represented. And that's what we are struggling to do in this country. Pastor Nelson uh, referenced a charismatic leader who could lead the majority. That's what has been happening for over 200 years. The majority have had their rights protected, but there are minorities whose rights have not been protected in this country. Um, I, I will give a very quick story because I know that uh, you know time is limited. Um, a few years ago, I had a mediation, and I arrived at the mediation with my attorney, and the mediator put me and my counsel and our co-defendants in one room, the plaintiff and their attorney in one room, and we never got to see each other. The only thing I knew about the plaintiff at that time, that this was um, a Native American family. Um, we had provided care to their child, and unfortunately, the child passed away and died. And so we were here to try to get this case resolved. They were represented by the best attorney medical malpractice attorney in the state of Connecticut. So I was very nervous. I didn't know what they would demand to settle the case. And as we started the mediation, and the mediator came and told us what their demand was, it was an astronomical number. It was breathtaking. It took your breath away. And our co-defendant's counsel closed his laptop and started putting it in his bag because we were going to leave. There, there was no way we could get the case settled. And I said, hold on a minute. Let us. Let's start the process. And so we made a counteroffer, and we went back and forth for about an hour and a half. And they came down in increments um, that mirrored the increments we went up. And we realized the case was not going to settle. And so, you know, we mentioned this to the mediator. He went out, and with a few minutes later, there was a knock on the door. And I thought this was the mediator coming back in to tell us. This is over. But it was plaintiff's counsel. He broke all protocol, knocked on the door, entered the room, and he looked at me and he said, John, can you come and meet my clients? And so, you know, my, I had my attorney with me and he was getting up to, you know, protest. And I said, no, I got this. I walked into the room and then I realized what the issue was. It was an African-American family with Native American heritage. And they were in tears, they were angry, they were frustrated. And they looked at me and they're like, well, what are you gonna do, what are you gonna say? And I looked at them and I said, you have the best attorney in the state of Connecticut. I wanna assure you of that. The second thing I said was, we have the best mediator here to help us get this case resolved. And I said, on behalf of the institution, I want to apologize for what has happened to you. I can't bring your child back, but I give you my word that if you're patient with us, we're going to get this case settled. And they looked at me, and we shook hands, and I left. And within 15 minutes, we had the case settled. We settled the case because they saw someone in that process that looked like them. They were there, and there was no one, they, they were, the attorney was white, the mediator was white, um, the attorneys who would question them were white, and they didn't see a face like, like, that looked like theirs, and they didn't trust the process. This is what we are dealing with as a country. We need to see faces that look like mine, um, and yours in every area. We need, to, we need representation that's in the government and that's even within the church so that we can build the trust uh, necessary to build a more perfect union. Um, I'll say this in closing. Uh, in the last couple of years, the New York Times published um, a series of article, articles on the year 1619. And this was, they were looking at the history of this country. And they started highlighting things about this country that made many people uncomfortable. And as a result of that, we saw laws being passed banning critical race theory. Critical race theory is a 
sort of political philosophy, looking at structures around race that you can't teach children. Basically, what these states were doing was banning the teaching of history that made people uncomfortable. But that goes against what this country is all about. What this country is all about is including all voices. When we look at the Gospels, there are four Gospels. There are the different perspectives um, of, of the people who encounter Jesus. And this is what we should try to promote, looking at all voices, including all voices in this country. Amen. We heard this afternoon, and we all knew it before that, that the COVID pandemic has significantly impacted us, impacted our church, our nation, and our world. It's also impacted the religious liberty department of our church. One of the significant issues that has come to the forefront for religious liberty leaders is how do we deal with the requirement for an employee to be mandated to receive a vaccination or lose their job? Uh, how, how do we as religious liberty directors of the Seventh-day Adventist Church relate to that? As you're aware, the Seventh-day Adventist Church does not have a policy does not have a doctrine that says you should not receive the vaccination. That that is strictly a personal decision on the part of the member. So why do I, as Religious Liberty Director of Mid-America Union Conference, why would I deal with members that have the belief they should not be vaccinated? It's not a policy of the church. In fact, various church levels have indicated that we should receive the vaccination. So what do we do when we have a phone call from a member saying, I'm ready to lose my job if I don't get vaccinated? The decision to help members, assist members at Mid-America Union is based on my belief that as Mid-America Parole Director, I'll assist any member to obtain an accommodation as long as it does not interfere or conflict with an established doctrine of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. So then, if I'm going to help them with their religious belief, my first task, my first duty in dealing with these people is to determine whether or not their objection to receive a vaccination is truly a religious objection or is it an objection based on social, political, or science-based uh, beliefs or ideals. So. I, in good conscience, cannot tell an employer, this person has a religious belief and we're asking for a religious exemption unless I've determined that is, in fact, a religious belief and not a belief based on politics, science, or just an idea of their own that is not based on religion. So how do I determine whether or not that belief is in fact religious and not based on another ideal. As you know, there's no bright line test to determine whether it's a religious belief, but I can visit with that member and if their explanation is not starting with a scripture, does not start with an explanation of their relationship to God, if it doesn't have one of those two bases for their explanation, for their belief, then it's hard for me to determine that their belief is in fact a religious belief and that I can in good conscience tell their employer, yes, this person does have a religious belief that needs to be accommodated. 
the administration of Mid-America Union Conference has authorized me to make known to employers that I'm the attorney for the Mid-America Union Conference of Seventh-day Adventists and religious liberty director for that church, or for our church. Uh, so I, in Mid-America Union, will assist members from the beginning of their request for religious accommodation for uh, vaccination exemption, and will help them through the process of contacting the employer and going through the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission process as, as their attorney, as working with them uh, and uh, contacting them as attorney for the church. It's, it's not universally believed that what the position that I take should be the appropriate dis appropriate position of a religious liberty director. But in wrapping this up, it's my position that as a defender of religious freedom, as a defender of matters of conscience, it's my privilege to assist our members to be able to follow their conscience in maximizing their relationship with God. And because they have a belief that may vary from a majority of Seventh-day Adventist members, does not mean that that religious belief that they have is not important. I want to help every member that I can maximize that relationship with God, and I feel that it's important to do that even when that religious belief deals with vaccination. Thank you, Dr. Nelson, for your wonderful message. It was on point. We're seeing more and more little surveillance cameras popping up. And more and more cell phones calls are being intercepted without warrants, without probable cause. And that's very concerning to me. I chose a um, controversial topic because I'm, I'm concerned about it, and that is the, the impact of the LGBTQ plus community on, on religious liberty. My wife and I have purposely cultivated friendship with a number of people in that community. Uh, in my wife's law school section, there was a lady that was appointed to set up a, a, a gay student group at Oklahoma City University School of Law, it's United Methodist School. And we have purposely cultivated friendship with this lady. Why? We win friends for God's kingdom as a rule. And she's gone through some significant health issues, and we've told her that we're praying for her, and she's been very appreciative. But yet, it, and, and it's, it's a part, too, of like Brother Orland said, we've got to make friends before we need them. So we need to do that for the sake of God's kingdom. But one of the challenges we face here is, is a lack of, what, what I see is, is perhaps some lack of respect on, on both sides. A year ago in the NCAA tournament, the Oral Roberts Golden Eagles made it to the Sweet 16. And those of you who follow the March Madness, the college basketball tournament, know that if their small college team makes it to the Sweet 16, everybody's fawning over them. You know, they're the darling of the tournament. But it was interesting with the Golden Eagles from Oral Roberts University in Tulsa that USA Today said, this is not the feel-good story that we need. 
and they were very clear that the MCA should denounce the University of Tulsa for their, what they felt were outdated views on, on sexuality. Oral Roberts is not the only one that's challenged. Our, our schools, particularly our, our universities, is, are challenged in, in this particular area. And we need to be respectful. I would like to see more respect on, on that side, too, because re respect breeds respect. Instead of trying to, to force their way in, in every way, they need to be treated equally before the law. That's the only thing I agree with in, in the Equality Act. They need to be treated equally before the law. But we need, we need to treat each other with respect, and hopefully in that way we can break down some of the barriers to religious liberty, but even more importantly, see individuals in God's kingdom as a result. Amen. I want to... I want to speak um, to the increasing uh, polarization along party lines that we're seeing on social media, um, uh, red and blue churches, and red pastors at, at times being moved to red churches and, and blue, chur uh, blue pastors, if you will, being moved to blue churches. And I believe as Seventh-day Adventists and as a church that we can do much better in, in, in that area. We're called to reach every nation, every kindred, tongue, and people, and that includes both Democrats and Republicans. Amen. And Ellen White, one of our church founders and pioneers, emphasized the imperative to reach the large cities uh, in the United States and abroad and it's a demographic that is predominantly blue. And we cannot allow political affiliation to deter the mission that each of us are called to bear to all sides of the equation. And on the flip side, we also need to be thoughtful in terms of reaching the rural communities and not allow political affiliations and rhetoric to deter us from the mission to that context as well. Nothing should be permitted to impede the reception of the everlasting gospel. And finally, this is something that I feel very strongly about, and that is the rhetoric and sometimes aggressive rhetoric that we're witnessing in social media against government institutions and entities and by ministry leaders and, and our laity. And there is, and I'm speaking to my conservative, spirit of prophecy believing friends, that there is explicit counsel from the pen of inspiration that we should not be doing that, we, that we need to refrain from doing that because the last thing we need is to get on some list that will deter us in terms of our influence and our mission in, in these last days. So I'm just gonna take a slight detour here. I did mention earlier that Andy and Laura are a team and um, we need to have a, this is a very male dominated panel, isn't it? And it's funny because three of the top four religious liberty leaders at the NAD are actually women, between Bettina Krauss and Melissa Reed and Jennifer Wood. Uh, Orlin Johnson is the, uh, is the standout male exception. But for some reason, they all went home and aren't on our panel here. Something about children and some, I, I, I just, you can't get away from the stereotype, can you? Um, but, but we do have Laura here, and she has graciously agreed to give us a comment uh, from the floor so we can have at least one woman's voice represented uh, on our panel. And uh, we'll glad you're willing to do this, Laura. Thank you. Not a problem. Thank you, Nick. Sorry for the intrusion here. And I'm just going to be doing it right here. My children are right here. And uh, hopefully they don't go gallivanting down the, the, the church here. But um, uh, as a um, uh, associate or assistant religious liberty director with my husband, I deal uh, primarily with uh, religious accommodations. 
um, that is a big part of um, what I do for our conference. So what, what is religious accommodation? So um, it taught me a lot about religious freedom. When I was younger, I was horribly, horribly, horribly ignorant about this subject. I'm like, of course we have religious freedom. It's written right there in the First Amendment. What does our First Amendment say? You know, guarantees um, freedoms concerning religion, expression, assembly, and the right to petition. Right, so I remember um, somebody many years ago who was an attorney and he said he, his dream was to have a, uh, a firm that deals only with religious freedom. And I thought, what, what, what in the world could you be talking about? I mean, we, we've got it all. But um, my eyes have been opened uh, many ways since then. Um, uh, what we, we may have the right to worship and assemble and practice our religion, but that doesn't mean that there aren't peoples and organizations and employers who either knowingly or unknowingly, they could be ignorant about this, but they can and sometimes do infringe upon those rights. And that's where my office plays just a tiny little role in, a, in trying to help out. And one thing that we can be proud of with our denomination is that we are there to assist with all accommodations. Um, not many denominations provide that type of assistance, but we as a denomination do, and that's something that we need to be very proud of. Um, workplace accommodation is something that I, uh, com uh, I cover the most. I receive at least one or two requests every single month with somebody who would like a Sabbath accommodation letter. Um, how do we do that? Well, in Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, religion is a protected category um, in the workplace. Uh, right now, there is a, a case that the Department of Justice is um, taking on, and they are actually suing the city of Lansing on behalf of a, um, a former corrections officer who is a Seventh-day Adventist who was terminated from her position because they said that she did not disclose that she was a Seventh-day Adventist. But it's all, well, she's saying she did. It's all kind of boiling down to the word flexible. What does flexible mean? But in any case, we're taking a, a big look upon this uh, with um, great interest. Um, so, and then also we deal a lot with prisoners' rights. Um, there were, there was a case that I helped with in the Muskegon area of, of uh, Michigan where some prisoners wanted to be baptized, but the, but the chaplain of that prison was, was forbidding it for, for reasons that we don't even know about. So that's where I became involved. I, I wrote a letter. I spoke to the chaplain. He asked me to appeal it, which I did. It was denied with no reason given. So then um, we got more people involved. Uh, we, we sent a letter to the warden and also the head of the Department of Corrections of Michigan. And um, we emphasized our lupa. <laughs> Religious Land Use and Institutionalized Persons Act. I'm, I'm proud of myself. <laughs> that, that is uh, specifically used for those that are in our prisons and the rights that they have. And by God's grace, um, six people were baptized Amen. in that prison by God's grace. <laughs> Amen. We, we weren't allowed to take any pictures and apparently the water was ice cold. <laughs> but we still got the baptisms by God's grace. So um, I just want to end by saying in these situations, knowledge is powerful, isn't it? Do, do we know what our rights are as Seventh-day Adventists? We have the First Amendment. We have um, Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. We have, you know, for our brethren that are in prisons, we have our lupa. Um, know what your rights are, and certainly your employers or, or those people that, that don't want to give you, they're never gonna tell you that you have this right, right? You need to arm yourself 
with this knowledge. Knowledge is powerful, and reach out to um, people that are on the stage here, um, at your conferences, at your unions, and um, we, uh, we are there for you to assist, um, and we need to keep our religious accommodations as long as that we can, as long as we are able to. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. So you young ladies out there, Laura actually has a law degree in Canada. And uh, she's thinking about uh, get, getting it in America as well, but she's been a real blessing to the Michigan Conference in using her talents and skills. And you, any young ladies, girls out there, you can do what Laura does someday if God calls you to it. And I want to greet my friend and basketball buddy and recently ordained Nikolai, Nikolai Greaves. Uh, it's a pleasure to see you. Other pastors were introduced, so I want to take this opportunity to recognize you and welcome you here. Good to see you, Nick. Uh, okay, Orlin, I think we're on to you. Thank you very much, and uh, we appreciate those words that were brought. You know, it's interesting when you think about public affairs and religious liberty, as, as Nick brought up, uh, the diversity of even the leadership has really caused our church to be very, very different. And the idea of who we are from a church perspective and who we represent and how we represent and how that voice is put forward is such a critical part of what we're trying to do. You know, one of the cases that I found very interesting was the, um, the Joe Kennedy Pemberton case. Um, it was a case that was regarding a coach of a football team who wanted to go out at the center portion of the field after the game was over and have, quote unquote, a private prayer. Um, for many years, uh, the concept of how you handle prayer in a public venue or in a school venue was really couched under what we've known as being the lemon test. And, and it was a case that came out in 1971 that really provided a lot of different hurdles to make sure that we are not engaging in any activity in which we are potentially coercing anyone from a public perspective to engage in a quote unquote formal prayer in a public setting. I think the point that was very interesting to me in particular that Dr. Nelson raised today is whether you are on one side of the argument or on the other side of the argument, the understanding of whatever you thought was the law could change in the flip of a switch is where we are right now. You know, the idea of whether or not you think it's okay for somebody to pray at midfield after a game that's not asking the players to do so, that's not quote unquote coercing players, I could see how an argument could go both ways. I understand how the court could say, well, you cannot put that particular situation in a box that you would not have put a secular situation in the box. I understand that as well. However, we are seeing decisions, in my opinion, taking place at the Supreme Court where they're no longer, in many instances, just looking to be an interpreter of the law. It seems as though they are now getting into a point where let's look for specific cases we may be able to overturn, which almost feels like they would like to be the creator of the laws. And that's where I think we as a church have to really stay alert. You know, I, I always had struggles when I would tell some uh, of our leadership that just because the ruling seems to fall in line with your religious beliefs right now does not mean we have to start running down the street and saying, ha ha, thank you very much. Because at the end of the day, we want to keep that out of the sphere. Why? Because if somebody else's religion that they agree with what's going on, that's much bigger than us. That's much strong, <clears throat> stronger than us. <clears throat> Excuse me. Then we have bigger problems. And we have to remember, <clears throat> excuse me, that at the end of the day, if we are doing something that is leading in the wrong direction, we will end up creating more problems than not. Thank you. Um, good evening. I guess I'm the last person between you and the um, reception right. <laughs> next door, so I will be quick. But well, once again, I want to thank um, Dr. Nicholas Miller, the Lake Union Prowl Department. Also have their communications director, um, Debbie <coughs> Michelle, who is here as well. I want to recognize her. And forgive me, Sister Nelson, I said Carol instead of Karen. 
So forgive me, but it's nice to have you here. And then Letitia Sylvester is back. Tish is now right for her husband. We're going to recognize her. Um, Dr. Nelson, Dr. Dwight, um, we've had a journey over the last 40 years from Ruth Murdoch to Andrews Academy to adulthood. And then now my children, uh, Megan's at Oakwood, who was with Satellite with Andrews. And now my son, who's a junior at Andrews Academy, is working with Satellite. So once again, thank you for your leadership, your clarity with regards to your messages. And one of the things that you said tonight that I hope um, resonated with all of us, we want the same civil liberties as we want for ourselves for white supremacists. And I hope that did not get lost on anyone because that is 100% facts. That is true. We do want the same civil liberties for white supremacists as we do want for ourselves. And when he said that, I looked at, um, thought about Peter in Acts 10, 35, 34 and 35, and it says, Peter opened his mouth. This is when he was going to visit the um, centurion Cornelius and says, truly, I understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. And one of the responsibilities I have for tonight was to comment on the raid uh, took place in Florida. I'm sure that you heard about the former president and how that will impact the election season. And from a Christian standpoint, it really shouldn't matter. If we take a look at the law, we have to understand whether or not was there a probable cause. That was the only responsibility of the magistrate was determine whether it was probable cause. It didn't matter whether the person was a man or a woman, a Democrat or a Republican, a former president or a janitor. The whole idea was to determine whether or not probable cause took place. The magistrate determined that it did take place and they issued the search warrant and executed the search warrant. Uh, we have to understand that as we want the same civil liberties for ourselves as we want for others, that God is no respecter of persons, but neither should we be respecter of persons. And we should treat everyone the way that we would want to be treated. Amen. So in closing, I just want to remind you that the Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward all of us, not wanting any of us to perish, but for all of us to come to repentance, 2 Peter 3, 9. That is my prayer for me, for you, and that is my prayer for myself. God bless you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, brothers and sister, for sharing with us some of the insights. I just wanted to give you a kind of an overview, a taste of what some of your PARL leaders and directors are thinking about current events and issues. And um, one question you might have is, uh, with all these black and dark suits, what am I doing in this bright green suit? Is it like, is it St. Pa is it St. Patrick's Day this weekend? Isn't that in March? I think it's in March. But there's actually something symbolic about this. Um, uh, my middle name is Patrick, did you know that? And my son's first name is Patrick. And so that combined with this will tell you I, my heritage is from what country? Ireland, it's true. My mother was born in Ireland and three of my four, three of the four grandparents of my father are from Ireland. I'm about 95% Irish. And so of course I have an interest in Irish heritage, St. Patrick. Uh, there's a, there's a, 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 quite a book called How Ireland, How the Irish Saved Civilization. And it's only perhaps a slight exaggeration um, it has to do with the monasteries in Ireland. As the Roman Empire was collapsing, there were small monasteries where reading and writing and language and the arts were kept alive. And St. Patrick is part of that story. And St. Columba, if you read in the, uh, in the Great Controversy, it tells the story about even Sabbath being preserved for a period of time beyond the reaches of the Roman church. There was a faithfulness to God's word that helped return biblical literacy to mainland Europe. And eventually the seeds of the Protestant Reformation were sown. And what strikes me about that story is how it was such a small group of individuals, right? such a small group on the margins of civilization. And when you grow up in a church, you think it's really big and impressive and there's lots of people in it. But after you've lived out in the big wide world for a while, you recognize 
how relatively small and insignificant it is. You know, here we are in Shiloh Church. Is it one of the biggest churches in Chicago? And Chicago is a huge city. Shiloh is a small drop in, a, in, in one of the neighborhoods of Chicago. Andrews University, the flagship university of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, a small university um, in, a, in, in, in the Midwest of the United States, not one of the great universities, and yet we make great claims, don't we, about our message, about what we believe, about its significance, and about what will happen in the last days. And most people looking at us and our size and the problems in society would laugh at that. And so would I if it wasn't for my study of history and my study at particular times in history, and one of them being Ireland in the beginning of the medieval period, where a small group of faithful men and women who stayed faithful to God's calling and to God's word were able to plant seeds and grow them in ways that impacted the world vastly beyond the numbers that they had. And I think that's a message, a metaphor for us, for our religious liberty work, and for our prophetic evangelistic work, that God doesn't call us to be the biggest and the best and the brightest. He calls us to be faithful with the message that we've been given. And I pray that you will join us as your parole leaders in the church. Uh, we support new members who are seeking to be faithful regarding the Sabbath, taking them through difficult periods. Let's pray that we can be faithful together in bringing this message of current events, public affairs, religious liberty, and prophecy to a world that is quickly winding down. I'm wondering if I can ask Pastor Dwight to close us out with a word of prayer as we invite you also over to the refreshments that will happen next door. Let's stand together. God has been good for us to be together this afternoon. We could have been anywhere else, but you arranged our lives so we've been in this space. And to be reminded of the high cost heaven has paid for the liberties we cherish, our Lord himself conspired against by all the forces of evil, Yet, as Colossians 2.15 declares, he publicly triumphed over them at the cross. We belong to that Jesus. He is our Lord. He's our master. He's our savior. So tonight, doesn't matter what happens tonight on the way home, we are secure in the one who loved us and gave himself for us. And keep the, keep the liberties of the gospel, the liberties of the kingdom alive and fresh in our hearts. Let us be contagious witnesses for the Lord, telling the good news of Jesus to, to the windy city, to the nation, to the world. Make us each ambassadors of the King. Believing the best is yet to come, send us out into this new week with the joy and the grace and the power and the Spirit of Christ our Lord, in whose name we pray. Amen. 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 And I know some of you may have questions for the speakers. A number of us, anyway, will be over at the reception. Uh, and our communications people want to take a picture of you all. So the panelists, if you can just uh, gather at the front here. And with uh, also Pastor Dwight, uh, or perhaps be part of our picture. Who do you want, Debbie? This is Laura, too. Yeah, and Laura? Where's the camera? Who's got the camera? Oh, okay. Right. Are we, do we need to bunch together more, or are you going to be able to catch us? Let's have a wide angle lens for this. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Spectacular. Oh, praise the Lord. Yeah. So.